Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Allison Caffarone, the Executive Director of the Program on Corporate Compliance and Enforcement at NYU School of Law. We are honored to be hosting the Assistant Attorney General of the U.S. Department of Justice's Antitrust Division, Macon Del Rahim. Before we begin tonight, I just want to take a minute to note, and this is different than PCCE's normal rules, so um, I just want to note that AAG, the AAG's remarks, as well as the Q&A following the remarks, will be on the record and recorded. Um, and Professor Harry First of NYU Law School will be moderating that Q&A as well as the panel discussion following. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Professor Harry First. I don't usually get to stand here. Uh, this is the room that uh, the faculty has faculty meetings in, not all the time, but sometimes, and the dean sits here, and we sit out there. If you say something bad, they bring the lions in in the middle, and they eat you. So um, just be careful. Don't fall into the pit, and you'll be fine. Uh, so I'll welcome you as well. Um, it's, uh, it's great to have such a big audience here. Um, even almost as big as the faculty, actually, now that I think of it. So um, I get to introduce Macon Delrahim. Many of you um, uh, here know Macon already, but uh, for those of you who don't, and even for those of you who do, um, I get to uh, give a little introduction in terms of his background. Um, as many of you know, uh, Macon, everyone calls him Macon. Uh, you know this. I, I read it in... He was interviewed in the Wall Street Journal on Monday. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, and it said, everyone calls him Macon. So here we go. Uh, in any event, um, uh, Macon came to the job as Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division with a very rich antitrust background. Um, practice law with a private law firm uh, representing many important corporations, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the George W. Bush administration uh, for two years. Uh, he was a member of the Antitrust Modernization Commission, uh, which was appointed to examine all of antitrust law at uh, what, what I like to call the turn of the century, um, but which gave its report uh, in 2007. Um, immediately prior to being uh, chosen to be the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division, he was Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy White House Counsel. Um, I asked him uh, uh, how he got the job, actually. Uh, and he said this was the job that he wanted of any job in the administration, which was wise, because who would want to be the, well, no, okay, I won't say anything. <laughs> um, and also uh, uh, at the, um, on sort of the other end of his career, um, in, um, in some sense a more political position, um, he was staff director and chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, then chaired by Senator Hatch, um, uh, at a time when the senator was very supportive uh, of the Justice Department's effort to sue Microsoft uh, for monopolization. Um, so Macon, I think, uh, made a wise choice in wanting this job because um, this really is antitrust time, I think. Uh, as, um, as much in the political spotlight as I ever remember it, my, my memory doesn't go back to 1912, um, but that would be the other time you would think of. It's a, obviously, as you all know, antitrust has become quite important politically, and um, maybe he's been in the spotlight a little more than other um, heads of the antitrust division have, including um, this um, interview in the Wall Street Journal. Antitrust cop balances tech issues. So note the cop, because today's discussion is about the cop part. Um, and. Um, Macon, there, there are two interesting things in this which I think um, sheds light on uh, how Macon views the job and how he's viewed. So one is, um, in two years, the, the article says, in two years as antitrust chief, he's crafted a blend of antitrust enforcement that follows neither the traditional Republican nor Democratic playbooks. And I think that that's right. Um, it's been a very interesting two years. Um, and he's also quoted as saying, the call for stronger antitrust enforcement is bipartisan 
and this transcends political parties or views. So there is an aspect in particular, I think, with cartel enforcement that is bipartisan. Um, so if it's unusual for an assistant attorney general in charge of the antitrust division to be interviewed and published in the Wall Street Journal, it's also unusual for someone in that position to come to NYU Law School and give a speech. So in the entire time I've been here, I won't tell you it's not back to 1912, but it's a few years, um, I don't remember another head of the antitrust division actually coming to this law school and giving a speech, except for one person. The one person was Macon, uh, who gave his first speech, actually, as head of the antitrust division uh, at a conference that Professor Fox and I ran uh, in October of 2017 on antitrust in developing countries. So it was a very interesting and uh, thought-provoking speech then, and I expect today's speech will be the same. So with all of that, um, I know he's around someplace. There he is, right, okay. And looks uh, even better than his picture in the Wall Street Journal. So over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor First, for those kind words. Uh, he and I met, I don't know, probably almost 20 years ago, right after he had written an important book uh, around the Microsoft investigation and some of the transgressions uh, of Microsoft. And it's great to see a number of my colleagues from the Justice Department and across the various offices of the at DOJ. Uh, and as well as colleagues from the private sector, many of whom were my former colleagues. Uh, Renata, who's obviously a former leader of the division, um, and John, with whom I had the great honor to serve on the Antitrust Modernization Commission, and, and I'm sure many others uh, here. So thank you for inviting me to be here. And let me also thank uh, Professor Jennifer Arlen and uh, Professor Allison Caffaroni. I hope I'm pronouncing you right name correctly. Um, I'm known as Macon just because my last name is difficult to pronounce. Uh, when I was going for my confirmation hearing and did the courtesy visits of the Judiciary Committee, the Judiciary Chairman, Senator Grassley, who used to be on the Senate Judiciary Committee when I served <clears throat> as a counsel on there, he came like, Macon, I've known you for 20 years. I never knew you had a last name. <laughs> And uh, I took that as a great compliment, uh, especially coming from uh, someone of his stature, but uh, I've been fortunate to at least have um, an easier to pronounce first name. Uh, you guys should be proud of this organization. I was recently with my old friend and colleague, Rod Rosenstein, who was here, I think two years ago, uh, at the same center for, uh, for a talk on corporate compliance. And he was telling me how much he enjoyed the experience and I think the program that you guys have built here um, has been incredible. It's been enduring and you know, exploring the, uh, the causes of corporate misconduct and the nature of effective uh, enforcement and compliance. Uh, and it's great to be back at NYU for the second time in this, in this tenure um, and, and to be here at, this, at the law school. As you guys know, a violation of the U.S. antitrust laws may have criminal or civil consequences depending on the conduct. Although robust compliance programs are important to avoiding both criminal and civil antitrust liability, my remarks today will focus exclusively on how compliance programs are relevant to the antitrust division's criminal enforcement efforts. Although compliance has long been a feature of corporate criminal enforcement landscape, the division's approach largely has remained unchanged since the early 1990s. In recent years, though, the antitrust division's approach to evaluating and crediting effective compliance programs has been evolving. To help us explore compliance programs and their implications for improving our enforcement policies for criminal antitrust offenses, we proposed a public workshop which was held last year at the Great Hall of the Justice Department. We heard from many in-house and outside corporate counsel and international enforcers, our colleagues around the world in this effort, all of whom shared their perspectives on antitrust compliance and offered suggestions on how the division could better encourage compliance efforts. Since the roundtable, 
we have continued to review this issue internally across the department and with cartel enforcement authorities outside the U.S. so that we could better understand uh, and better improve our efforts uh, for antitrust enforcement and to further incentivize compliance and good corporate citizenship more generally. In an ideal world, corporate compliance programs prevent wrongdoing altogether. If violations do occur, robust compliance programs should lead to prompt detection, which not only nips the conduct in the bud earlier, minimizing the harm to consumers, but also gives companies the greatest chance of winning the race for leniency under the antitrust division's corporate leniency policy. If a company does not win the race for leniency, then the division's approach has been to insist that it plead guilty to a criminal charge with the opportunity to be an early and cooperator and potentially receive a substantial penalty reduction for timely, significant, and useful uh, cooperation is, uh, in assisting the division's efforts to hold the co-conspirators and other culpable individuals accountable. This all or nothing philosophy was born out of our efforts to highlight the value of winning the race for leniency at a time when the modern leniency program was establishing itself as a division's most important investigative tool. And it remains the division's most important prosecutorial tool for battling uh, uh, criminal antitrust conduct. I believe the time has come to improve the division's approach and recognize the efforts that some companies make in investing significantly in robust compliance programs. In the words of our former Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, who I noted earlier, he said, quote, the fact that some misconduct occurs shows that a program was not foolproof, but that does not necessarily mean it was worthless. We can, make, we can make objective assessments about whether programs are implemented in good faith. I agree completely with Rod, and having spoken recently with his successor, my friend Jeff Rosen, our new Deputy Attorney General, he shares those same views. Therefore, effective immediately, the Antitrust Division will, one, change its approach to crediting compliance at the charging stage, two, clarify its approach to evaluating the effectiveness of compliance programs at the sentencing stage, and three, for the first time, make public a guidance document for the evaluation of compliance programs in criminal antitrust investigations. I'll address each of these points in turn. First things first, and at the risk of wading into a long-standing rivalry, let me share the words of a wise Philadelphian, Benjamin Franklin, who famously coined the phrase, quote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure to urge fire awareness and prevention. He warned that in the absence of trained firefighters and public education about fire safety and prevention, Philadelphians may be forced, as he once put it, to leap out of windows and hazard their necks to avoid being oven roasted. Some of you here today may relate to Franklin's vivid description of the 18th century Philadelphia fires with your own, quote, hair on fire experiences when a corporate client first realizes that it is implicated in a criminal antitrust investigation. A company's cartel fire can quickly spread from criminal fines to civil treble damages and other collateral consequences and engulf the entire company, its employees and its shareholders in expensive investigations, protracted litigation, and cause real damage to its reputation and standing. Franklin's words ring just as true today when applied to deterring antitrust crimes. On the cure side of the equation, it is tough to disagree that the most effective deterrent to corporate criminal misconduct is identifying the people who commit crimes and sending them to prison. As prosecutors, we maximize deterrence by, by devoting significant resources to investigating and prosecuting individuals and corporations involved in cartels. We seek heavy fines for corporate offenders and actual jail time for culpable individuals acting on their behalf. The focus of my remarks today is on the benefits of an outcome of, of, the, of, of an ounce of prevention. Enforcement often is of inherently limited deterrent value because it is retrospective. On the other hand, 
a company with a, with a robust compliance program <clears throat> actually can prevent crime or detect it early, thus reducing the need for enforcement activity, minimizing the harm to consumers earlier, and saving precious taxpayer resources. As Rod previously has put it, quote, strong corporate compliance programs are the first line of defense to white collar crime, including antitrust crimes and cartel fires. It's important to keep in mind that while compliance is the focus of today's program, compliance programs do not exist and are not assessed in a vacuum. Indeed, the adequacy and effectiveness of a compliance program is but one of 10 factors that the Justice uh, Manual directs prosecutors to consider when weighing charges against a corporation pursuant to the principles of federal prosecution of business organizations. Among the factors to be considered, four in particular stand out as hallmarks of good corporate citizenship. Good corporate citizens, one, implement robust and effective compliance programs. And when wrongdoing occurs, they two, promptly self-report, three, cooperate in the division's investigation, and four, take remedial action. These factors go hand in hand. Companies should want to work with us to root out criminal antitrust misconduct within their organizations and help us hold accountable the individuals who create the liability for the organization. The division's new approach to compliance programs should not be misconstrued as an automatic pass for corporate misconduct. The principles of federal prosecution counsel against crediting compliance programs when the other three hallmarks of good citizenship are absent. When all four are present, however, the division should reward and, quote, provide incentives for companies to engage in ethical corporate behavior. That means notifying law enforcement about wrongdoing, cooperating with the investigation, remedying past conduct, and preventing future misconduct by implementing a robust compliance program. The more we do to recognize efforts to institute, strengthen, and improve such compliance programs cons consistent with department policy and sentencing guidelines, the stronger a company's incentives are to invest in compliance in the first place and to incentivize others to do the same. We can begin recognizing and rewarding these compliance efforts as early as the charging stage. As many of you know, the division has had a long policy that credit, credit should not be given at the charging stage for a compliance program and that leniency is available only to the first corporation to make full disclosure to the government. The justice manual further recognizes that, quote, the nature of some crimes, example, antitrust violations, may be such that national law enforcement policies mandate prosecution of corporations, notwithstanding the existence of a compliance program. It's important, however, that the antitrust division's practices and policies evolve to ensure that we have the right framework for maximizing deterrence and detection. We recognize the progress that has been made over the years in antitrust awareness and increased compliance, uh, and the increased compliance, and want to encourage companies to further invest in such efforts. And I'm pleased to announce that the Justice Department's manual has been updated to reflect the division's new approach to compliance. At our request, the manual's editors have deleted language from sections 928.400 and 928.800, stating that the antitrust division would not give credit at the charging stage for compliance programs. Uh, these revisions to the manual will be posted to the uh, department's website by tomorrow. And going forward, when deciding how to resolve criminal charges against a corporation, <clears throat> division prosecutors must consider the division's corporate leniency policy, the principles of federal prosecution, and the principles of federal prosecution of business organizations, including, quote, the adequacy and effectiveness of the corporation's compliance program at the time of the offense. Thank you. As well as at the time of the charging decision. The Antitrust Division Manual has also been updated to direct division prosecutors to evaluate all the factors, including pre-existing compliance programs in every corporate charging recommendation. In line with the manual, 
uh, the manual's guidance division has no checklist or formulaic requirements for evaluating the effectiveness of corporate compliance programs. Rather, prosecutors are to consider three fundamental questions in their evaluation. Is the corporation's compliance program well designed? Is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? Do, and does the corpora, uh, corporation's compliance program work? They're also to consider the, the relevant antitrust specific compliance questions detailed in the division's new public guidance document. I want to turn to the document a bit later in my remarks, but for now, I want to discuss the change. The change in the division's approach is a recognition that even a good corporate citizen with a comprehensive compliance program may nevertheless find itself implicated in a cartel investigation. Precisely how much weight and credit to give a compliance program will depend on the facts of the case. Our new approach allows prosecutors to proceed by way of a deferred prosecution agreement when the relevant factors, including adequacy and effectiveness of the corporation's program, weigh in favor of doing so. DPAs, as the Justice Manual recognizes, occupy an important middle ground between declining prosecution and obtaining the conviction of a, a corporation. We will, however, continue to disfavor non-prosecution agreements with companies that do not receive leniency because complete protection from prosecution for antitrust crimes is available only to the first company to self-report and meet the, the corporate leniency policies requirements. I should take a moment to emphasize that a compliance program does not guarantee a DPA. As the manual points out, the existence of a compliance program is not sufficient in and of itself to justify not charging a corporation for criminal misconduct undertaken by its officers, directors, employees, or agents. Instead, department prosecutors are directed to conduct a fact-specific inquiry into whether the program at issue is adequately designed for maximum effectiveness in preventing and detecting wrongdoing by employees. In making a charging recommendation, the division's prosecutors will evaluate the compliance program's effectiveness or lack thereof and holistically consider it together with all the other relevant factors. I also want to underscore the importance of the division's corporate leniency policy. Leniency has been an integral part of the division's criminal enforcement program for over 25 years, and it'll continue to be the ultimate credit for an effective compliance program that detects the antitrust crimes and allows prompt self-reporting. The key benefits of leniency are well known immunity from criminal charges and penalties for the company, NPAs for its covered cooperating employees, and detrebling and other benefits available under the ACPERA legislation. Nothing about today's compliance announcements changes the division's commitment to leniency, which remains available only to the first corporation to, take, to make full disclosure to the government. I'll turn to the compliance considerations at sentencing stage and briefly discuss the division's practice as it relates to various sentencing guidelines provisions that may implicate compliance. Antitrust compliance could be relevant to a corporation's sentencing in at least three ways. First, the sentencing guidelines provide for a three-point reduction in a defendant's culpability score if the company has an effective compliance program under the guidelines. Second, a compliance program may be relevant to determining the appropriate corporate fine to recommend within the guidelines range, or in extraordinary circumstances, whether to recommend a fine below the guidelines range. And third, the existence and effectiveness of a compliance program is relevant to the division's probation recommendation. The division has yet to recommend credit for a defendant's pre-existing antitrust compliance program under the guidelines three-point reduction. Delay in reporting and involvement of high-level or substantial authority personnel, as defined by the guidelines, often weigh against application of this provision. The division has, however, credited a company's extraordinary prospective compliance in certain cases uh, and advocated for a reduction in corporate fine to recognize efforts to prevent recurrence by, quote, 
changing its corporate culture and instilling a new attitude toward compliance and good corporate citizenship. A company without an effective program may also face probation under the, guiding, uh, under the sentencing guidelines. Typically, the division will not seek probation for pleading, for pleading corporations except in limited circumstances, such as when a company has not accepted responsibility or has received a penalty plus fine adjustment for failing to report other cartel conduct at the time of the prior plea. We may also seek probation when a company has been convicted after trial if the company still does not accept responsibility and declines to take measurements, measures to implement or improve its antitrust compliance program. Consistent with department guidelines and our past practice, our prosecutors are more likely to recommend an external monitor in egregious cases where one, the company refuses to improve its corporate culture to encourage compliance with the law, it refuses to implement an adequate antitrust compliance program or employs a grossly inadequate program after the antitrust violation, or it has engaged in recurrent antitrust violations. Going forward, the division's manual, which is publicly available, will provide additional clarity on how we consider compliance at sentencing, including our approach to recommending probation and guidance for selecting monitors. The revisions to the antitrust manual will also make clear that our prosecutors evaluate programs on a case-by-case -case basis and will consider the new antitrust guidelines in doing so. Speaking of this new guidance document, let me take a minute to discuss our motivations for drafting and publishing this document and provide a preview of its content. Last fall, we had the opportunity to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the antitrust a leniency program with many current and former division prosecutors. Earlier this year, we were pleased to dedicate an auditorium and lecture hall to Ann Bingaman, former Assistant Attorney General, who approved and oversaw the implementation of the leniency program in 1993. She was also the first woman AAG of the Antitrust Division. A significant uh, change back in 1993 for the leniency program at a time that was made to propel our enforcement efforts going forward. And one, we could say, that raised a few eyebrows in its day, not only in the United States, but abroad. Both celebrations serve not only as moments to reflect on the past 25 years, but also as a time to consider the next 25 years. As we think about the future of the criminal program, it's important for us to consider areas where we can make changes to further strengthen and enhance our enforcement efforts. That's why, for example, we have hosted a number of roundtables where we have heard from all sides of various issues we face today. In that spirit, one of the points that was re-emphasized for me at last year's compliance roundtable was a desire for greater clarity and transparency on the considerations weighed by the antitrust division when evaluating compliance programs. The consensus in-house counsel view appeared to be that clear written guidance from the division could be a useful tool in lobbying internally for increased antitrust compliance resources. We heard you. For the first time in the criminal program's history, we're issuing public written guidance intended to assist division prosecutors in their evaluation of compliance programs at the charging and sentencing stages of the investigation. This document draws on the experiences of division staff and leadership with antitrust compliance programs, as well as other resources within the Department of Justice, including the Justice Manual, the Criminal Division's Guidance Document on Evaluating Compliance Programs, uh, and it also draws on the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines Evaluation of Effective Compliance Programs. The document has two main sections one on compliance considerations at charging stage, and another focused on sentencing considerations. Like the criminal division's guidance, the charging section is framed around the three fundamental compliance questions in the justice manual that I mentioned earlier. Is the program well designed? Is it being applied earnestly and in good faith? And does it actually work in practice? The guidance elaborates on these questions by identifying elements of an effective program, including the design and comprehensiveness of the program, one. 
Two, the culture of compliance within the company. Three, responsibility for and the resources dedicated to antitrust compliance. Four, antitrust risk assessment techniques. Five, compliance training and communications to employees. Six, monitoring and auditing techniques, including continued review, evaluation, and revision of the antitrust compliance program. Seven, reporting mechanisms. Eight, compliance incentives and discipline. And nine, remediation methods. For each of these elements, it also provides additional questions prosecutors may consider depending on the facts that go to the effectiveness of the compliance program in deterring and detecting criminal conduct. Recognizing this is a lengthy list, the guidance emphasizes that these elements and questions are not a checklist or formula, and not all of them will be relevant in every case. With that in mind, the division's prosecutors should ask three preliminary questions at the outset to help focus their analysis. Does the program address and prohibit criminal antitrust violations? Second, did the antitrust compliance program detect and facilitate prompt reporting of the violation? And third, to what extent was a company's senior management involved in the violation? On the sentencing side, here, the guidance document details the division's approach to compliance considerations pertinent to sentencing guidelines and 3572. A subsection on sentencing reductions for an effective compliance program provides prosecutors guidance on a case-by-case -case assessment of the guidelines' rebuttable presumption that a compliance program is not effective when certain high-level personnel or substantial authority personnel participated in, condoned, or were willfully ignorant of the offense. Other sub subsections provide guidance on the division's approach to recommend, recommending probation, periodic compliance reports as a condition of probation, or an external monitor to ensure implementation of an effective program and timely reports. I hope and encourage you who have an interest in this area to review the guidance documents, which will be available on the division's website tomorrow. We at the Antitrust Division remain committed to continuously evaluating all of our practices as we have done over the past year to see if we can improve them. I hope my remarks today will incentivize more companies to make antitrust compliance a top priority. I and the rest of the division's leadership and staff look forward to engaging more on this important issue in the months to come. And for now, I just wanted to thank you and thank Professor First and this uh, program here for having me, and I hope you enjoy the next panel, the discussion, and the rest of the evening. Happy to take a, a few questions uh, not related to Sprint and T-Mobile, um, <laughs> if, if you have them. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you very much.